Okay. All right, tonight we have the honor of an honorable, an honorable person. Yeah. Honorable yeah. judge. You know, something's really... Your Washington County District 17, is it? The district... It's district... To or the second district, and I'm in Department 11. So second district, Department 11. I didn't know all that stuff, but oh, yeah. but, but I managed to get the, the number from the switchboard operator some way, and 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 he knows that you got to stomp out sanity, be committed, right? Because I always make that joke, because because and then sanity isn't all it's cracked up to be. We know that, but the judge is going to talk about. Um, some of the stuff that he presides over with the with the commitment hearings and the continuance commitment and denial rights and on through and stuff like that that we um, in the milieu um, work with and so it should be should be pretty interesting and I hope yeah, he's hoping that you guys will share about your experiences in the hospital so um, um, you guys please please be be able to share about when you've come out of the hospital and and how what i really wanted to do was to show the judge how what living well with mental illness is is all about okay so okay so help me welcome judge chuck Waller. Thank you. thank you i hope you don't mind if i sit down i work today and i'm tired a little bit i'll just tell you what i do and and then um, i'll talk to you about anything i brought the stuff that i use um, three years ago, I was assigned to do the involuntary mental health commitments in Washoe County. And so, if I've met any of you, uh, I do 2,000 cases a year, and I'm sorry if I don't recognize you, but uh, so for the most part, for the last three years, the involuntary mental health commitments, the involuntary administration of psychotropic drugs, I've, I've been the judge. I've heard people say that it's hard to get people involuntarily committed in Washoe County. Let me give you some, some statistics and tell you what's happened during the time that, that I've been the judge. When I became the judge, we were doing about four hearings a week, every Thursday, on involuntary commitment. And it was out of line. Um, the law is pretty clear that a, a judge, although we're supposed to ensure the rights of a person who might be involuntarily committed, the United States Supreme Court has been very clear that judges are to defer to the uh, opinions of med mental health professionals. Uh, it's not like putting somebody in jail uh, where you have to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That isn't the burden. Uh, as a result, there's a, there's a team of us. There's one um, public defender, Kathy O'Leary, and one district attorney, Blaine Cartledge, who work up the cases before Thursdays, and then I come in on Thursday and hear the contested cases. As I say, there were about four cases a week when I started doing this, but um, by talking with the two lawyers that are involved in the case and going over the law with them, we've really dramatically reduced that. In the last two years, in Washoe County, there have only been eight hearings for involuntary commitments, from four a week to four a year. Um, some of the stuff that's going on in, in this area right now is, um, when I came three years ago, there were the NAMs, none of the private hospitals had uh, procedures for approving involuntary medication that met the standards that the law requires. I wrote an article for, in, in a, the uh, Nevada Law Journal, the Boyd School of Law in, in uh, Las Vegas about that. And partially because of that article and partially because it's a small group of people who do this, and I, was, I, I know everybody who does it, and I was able to talk to them. NAMS has adopted a policy, and most of the private hospitals here in, in, the, uh, in northern Nevada have adopted policies that fit with the law. Another thing that you might have seen in the newspaper just a couple of weeks ago is uh, the state's compliance with a law that says if somebody is involuntarily committed, not voluntarily committed, but involuntarily committed, that they lose their Second Amendment rights to have firearms. Um, 
and uh, this, the court wasn't complying with the statute in this and a number of other areas. The law required uh, that the court report um, if somebody was found incompetent to stand trial as a result of mental illness, if they had a guardianship that made a determination of incompetence and involuntary mental health commitments. The court wasn't complying, but we're in compliance now. Those are some of the things that I do and some of the issues that are going on right now, and I, I'd be glad to elaborate on those things, but I'd really like to hear from you. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to talk to you all about anything you'd like to talk about. Um, Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm thinking for a while, NAMS was admitting people on a voluntary basis. And then about the time I left, they had they quit doing that. Are they back to doing that? Are, are people allowed to go in voluntary? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, voluntary? Yeah, I don't see that, but, but I know something about it. Uh, yes, people can go voluntarily. Uh, there's there are money problems like everywhere. I only get involved if there's a dispute. The hospital wants to commit somebody and the person doesn't want to be committed. That's when I come in. So I don't see the voluntary commitments. I also, if somebody, if a parent or somebody comes into the courthouse and say, says my son, one of my relatives needs to be, go in for a 72 hour hold to, to uh, assess them, I do those hearings as well. Yes, sir. Uh, I went into the state hospital in 20. Uh, what happened was is I, uh, I I got to the point of a blade, a scalpel blade to my brachial artery, and I never never actually had an attempt at suicide, but I was <coughs> ill. I was was yeah. I needed help. So I, I went, I called my mom, I said, wait, what's going on here? And I finally realized what the hell I'm doing. And I put the blade down, I called my mom and told her what happened. She told me to tell uh, Fallon Mental Health and then they gave me a legal 2000 hold and admitted me into the state hospital. Now what I don't understand is on base that I need help, why am I a, a ward of the state in a sense? If I, if I was only seeking help, why am I trying to get out of an SUV in, in, in shackles, in the, in the back of an SUV in shackles? If somebody does a legal 2000, also called a 72-hour hold, that can be initiated by a judge or a doctor, or a, there's a whole bunch of people identified in the statute that can initiate a 72-hour hold, a legal 2000. And what the law says is if there's a legal 2000, the police go and get that person mm -hmm. and take the person first to a doctor and then to the mental health hospital. The police have to do whatever they think is necessary for them to stay safe. There's no order from a court that says shackle this person. But I don't think the police take anybody to a police car without uh, putting them in handcuffs. But I think that's just but, police but policy. What I'm wondering is if I'm... If I'm seeking help, why am I criminalized? I understand. And it would be nice if we had somebody other than the police to go out and pick somebody up for a legal 2000, but we don't. It wasn't the police, it was my counsel, my counsel Dolly, Dolly Coke. Yeah. But it's happened a lot with a, a lot of no, number of people, and it's, I just need help. I'm not criminally you know, active, I'm not homicidal, I'm not suicidal. And I go to the hospital for for a vacation, basically, to reduce the stress. But I am seen as a criminal. I hear what you're saying, and and uh, you know, I mean, I, I appreciate knowing it. It's not something that I'm directly involved in, but but like the law that says, if if you're involuntarily committed for a, a mental health problem, you lose your Second Amendment rights. Well, I don't like that law. I mean, some people, that makes sense. Other people, that doesn't make sense. We treat everybody with a mental health problem as if they're all the same and everybody isn't the same. I've, I've encountered people on disability SSI that get robbed and the cops can't do nothing because the uh, robber said she acted crazy and she's crazy and the cops can't even prosecute the robber because she's labeled as crazy. You see what I mean? I mean, I got punched in my face and almost stabbed to death. 
And the guy walked because he said I was being crazy. When he was a psycho that freaked out because, you know, he, he had issues of his uh, sister dying in a plane crash, you know? And all I was doing was, you know, help be, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, there is no legality. All they have to say is he's crazy and they don't even pursue it. I do know what you mean. If you're telling me you're being discriminated against because yes. of mental illness, yes. I understand that. Are I can't even to... fight it in court because all they have to say is, oh, he was doing this and this, and they believe his word, the criminal's word, over the victim. I can tell you that I make people, in my court, I make people follow the law and treat people as the law requires. We have a mental health court in Washoe County, but it's not perfect. Yes, sir. What else? I know it's not perfect. I wish I could push it through and I'm getting um, through it. A lot of trauma. A lot of trauma based on. You know, I put on the criminal. I've I've talked to Sheila Leslie about the law to address some problems that I'm aware of in the, law, in the next legislature. Some in the area of involuntary uh, administration of psychotropic drugs. Mm -hmm. um, as an organization, funnel it to me what you think needs to happen in the law. Maybe we could get a bill together. We tried to get a bill together in this last legislature with the Attorney General's office. So but maybe we can address I some mean, concerns that way. Isn't a suicide attempt actually doing the attempt? I mean, I realized that I was flipping out. And I put the blade down, and I'm seen as a criminal. But the and boss, I can't pay $800 a month for prescriptions without Medicaid, so I can't even get Medicaid without SSI. What the law says about being committed for for, su for suicide is that you say something that, that you're going to commit suicide, and you make some act in furtherance of it. So it doesn't mean that you have to cut yourself. I think picking up the blade and holding it close to your wrist is yeah. probably enough. Right, you. Yeah, I, I need it. I need it. I need help. I need help. And I'm grateful for SSI and Medicaid. But now it's, it's so screwed up. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, we're in the wealthiest state in the union, and they're they're pushing uh, for us to get Medicare. And they're but trying now, to get rid of the new health care law. I don't understand it. I mean, I want the new health care law myself because it's, I, there are a lot of people out there that need the help. But I'm the state's responsibility, not the federal government. And they're and, and I can't even be seen at a you know, at to have surgery every now because I get Medicaid. I'm not the, you know, I'm a product of the well, state, not a product of the, the union. I, just, I so appreciate what you're saying. Um, let's let's talk to other people. Can I get a drink of water? I, he I don't just, want to be he just went to the no, you're not. Yeah, just, just I appreciate learning what you've got to say. How about somebody who else wants it? Well, let's. I was hoping. I, I, I asked. I asked this gal here because she went through what what we're talking about and. I've been through commitments, and um, there, there, there's there's a good side and a bad, a bad side in my view, and I just wanted to let you know that there are both sides to existence. One is that I was not always informed that I was being committed. I found that I would, I would come back to my room one day and there would be some paperwork on my desk showing, oh yes, you've been committed for such and such. I was not given the opportunity to um, defend myself. I was not given an opportunity to consult with an attorney. I, it just would happen. How did, I, it, 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 it's impossible under our law. I don't believe that. It did happen to well, me on a occasion. I'm not disputing what you're saying, right. but I'm saying if our law is followed, you can't be committed against your will without being assigned an attorney paid for by the the county and having a hearing in front of me it, if it happens another way it's not legal well then there were some illegal ones um, the good side of it is that the these involuntary commitments do offer a patient the benefit of time because a lot of times the disorders that set in are of long duration and take a little while to unravel and to come back to bring the patient, bring myself in this case back to reality. And so the length of time that they sometimes impose is not a bad thing. It's just that from my point of view, the beginning process was flawed. And, and I just wanted to share that. I appreciate it. It should not happen. I didn't think it should. 
Are you going to have to pick people? Well, wait, no, I go ahead, go ahead. I, I just wanted to, get some people I asked to come because okay. she's living well with her illness. And, well, I'll talk and, to everybody and, once and I want And I wanted people to show that they're living well with their illnesses, even after being, even after being committed, even after being, you know, because I was, li I was hospitalized seven times, and and I never wanted to be in there once, but, but yet once my parents and everybody got me in there, then I'd stay put, you know, and I would, then I would do it, and then I would realize toward toward the part of the later part of my stay that that I needed that support, and I think that's what she's saying that's too. That's what I'm trying it's to just, say. It's just yeah. hard to see us up front, and that's. We're, we're a lot of the snag gets, and that's and I don't know how to amend that because I never felt any of not animosity for being held against my will after later on. I never felt any animosity, but some people some people still harbor that stuff till till heck on Well, as I say, very few people now are being held against their will. Eight in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just glad to hear what Jay had to say, and I'm on the other side of the story with having to have my son involuntary committed uh, uh, probably half a dozen times. I'm really glad when the sheriffs come and put him in handcuffs because that protects him and it protects them. It's always a crisis situation when this happens and they have to respond in a crisis mode. So he might be kicking and screaming going there, but he's always grateful when he has this time to reflect back. If you said you have a choice and it's your will, you're saying that to somebody that's acting like a two-year-old child, you know, saying, do you want this big bag of candy or should I take it away from you? It, there, I don't know how you balance. I don't know how you balance the law with what needs to be done to, to help them. I don't know how you would step off the bench if it were your child and say, this, you know, he or she needs medication so that they can get level-minded so that we then can reason with them and get them out of danger. It's really rare that a judge following the law is going to say, don't medicate if a doctor is saying medicate. Don't commit if a doctor is saying commit. It almost never happens. Uh, we've had a doctor, we have doctors say don't medicate, don't commit. When but if you have doctors that are disputing, that makes it tough. That makes it very tough. What we, before somebody can be committed or before somebody can be involuntarily uh, medicated, what our law requires is that two mental health professionals, one of them being a psychiatrist, that don't work for the hospital have to get involved and interview the person and testify before the judge. So hopefully we're getting objective information. The, the, the people that we have that do this are excellent and it's, it's rare that the hospital and those two doctors disagree. They're almost always in agreement. We had it happen. I, I, it can happen, but it's, it's, it doesn't happen often. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Cliff Barber. Barber. Um, mine is, is recent and, and really sad in that I had my son involuntarily committed for 72 hours to NAMS. And they had a one year doctor resident person there because I guess they rotate the residents through there. And this was a six week rotation for her. And she decided that my son, who's been bipolar since he was seven, paranoid schizophrenic since he was 14, was psychotic when I committed him or involuntarily committed him. She decided that it was my parenting skills and that, I am, I am not lying, this just happened just a few weeks ago. It was my parenting skills and that my son had little friends that he was listening to and that everybody was mistaken. Now, I am t totally telling the truth. I got totally upset, went to the, uh, what do they call them, attending physician, the, the attending psychiatric physician, and I said to that person, uh, this one-year resident going through six weeks of whatever 
is going to say that my son, who's been diagnosed by all of these psychiatric, has been in mental <coughs> hospitals for years, blah, 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 is going to say that they're going to let go of the 72-hour hold and let him go home because it's my parenting skills <laughs> and his little, little friends. Now, the thing that's not so funny about it is four weeks ago, after getting let go from the 72-hour hold, my son beat me up, beat my daughter up, didn't know I was even who I am. He was beating me up trying to find his mother and is in jail now. And she said, and the attending physician says, well, I'm sorry, but we decided that he wasn't showing enough of the psychotic behavior and that we needed to, and I'm like, oh my God. And I saw when my son came home that something was wrong and I was just steadily trying to get him wherever. And I'm just saying, this is so true. I'm living it today. Next week, they're gonna let my son go and release him back to me and he beat me up. And the reason why they're gonna release him back to me is because he was found incompetent to stand trial and they, re they dropped all the charges of domestic violence from my daughter, domestic violence from me. Uh, they, and when he was in jail, true story, they took him off of all of his medicines. He was on nine medicines. Took him off that day. And then my son busted the windows in the jail, went off, he got a, a felony for damage to the jail, all that stuff. They said, oh, that's a moot point, Ms. Van Dyke, because we're dropping all the charges and sending him home to you. What am I gonna do with my son that just beat me up and doesn't even know who I am and isn't on his medication? So, I am saying, and I love the court system. I worked for the court system for 16 years that we as parents and consumers are frustrated with the jail, frustrated with NAMS, and, and I'm told that NAMS does that a lot because they don't have enough people, workers working there. She worked there. She has a son, but she worked there. And I'm there. frustrated as a And as she's a frustrated employee. as a NAMS employee yeah. and works there because they let the them NAMS. go because they don't have enough staff. And then, and then people like us get beat up. I had eight contusions in my head. I still have, ugh, I'm just frustrated because this just happened four weeks ago that I got beat up by my loving son who didn't know who I was. So I say all of that to say definitely things need to change. And I'm worried about my son getting out coming home to me, and then committing him probably through you to NAMS, and they say my son and my parenting skills, and they're gonna send him home, and then I'm gonna be, get beat up again. Or maybe my son is going to be the one that goes to uh, IHOP and shoot all those people. Or my son is going to be the one, because those are paranoid schizophrenics that the jail lets go. Barbara. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Sorry, Judge. No, uh, no, I'm really happy to hear this. That's why we got an error. Sorry to yeah. error. The only thing, the only time I get involved and have a hearing is when uh, they want to keep somebody and the person doesn't want to stay. So they don't bring cases before me where they want to, st the person wants to stay and the hospital wants to throw them out. So I don't get those cases but apply to me for a 72 hour hold. You got it. And then if they let them go, maybe apply for another 72 hour hold. Let's see how it works. I don't, I, I'm willing to work and try to have the right thing happen. Thank you, but the law does not allow the court to get involved when the hospital decides to kick somebody loose. That doesn't go before a court. And my second question to that is, can you do it before they're released? Because I don't want my son released to me. When's he get out? He gets out next week sometime. File the paperwork tomorrow or Monday. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Judge. Okay. Thanks, Barbara. I feel Barbara's frustration a lot. You know, as recently as 10 years ago, patients were allowed to stay in the hospital long enough to get well. Now the new thing, and I'm sure it's because of funding, 
is everybody's got to be gone from there in two weeks. I mean, it's really unusual to see a patient there longer than two weeks. So we watch over and over and over and over again people leaving before they're ready. And it's just, you know, it's, it's really frustrating for the families. Um, you know, like you say, because you just, you know, they're, they're victims of it too, you know. Um, and I'm sure it's a funny issue, but, uh, you know, it's like two weeks is the maximum stay now. And, you know, it's, it's not just you don't get over mental illness that quickly. You know, it takes a while to stabilize. Most of the meds take a while to, to take effect. And, um, I mean, this isn't, you know, the court issue exactly. This right. is a... This is a funding issue. I mean, it's a political the, 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 issue. It yeah, depends on which party you vote into People, office, which way it's going to go. You know, me mental health is not the end issue, and a lot of the public doesn't want to vote for the funding that's needed. And that's a fact. Yeah. You know, and, uh, mental health doesn't bring money. It takes money out. It's, it's not like it's sports teams and, you know, where... And we lost and, people like Randolph Townsend who yeah, cared right, about right, it. Yeah. And so Sheila Leslie's probably right, the person yeah. that cares about it the most right now. Mm -hmm. And what people don't really you know when they're cutting mental health funding, people just end up in jail or on the streets or something like that.